Hello, this is Ukulaev TV, and we continue our broadcasting from Kiev, from Ukraine. And our guest today is famous military analyst Tom Cooper. Uh, Tom, hello, and thank you so much to be with us today. Hello, thank you very much uh, for inviting me, and very, very nice to be with you. Thank you. Uh, Tom, I read your regular review about the situation on the battlefield, and your reviews are always very detailed and that is why let's start from let's start from the situation on the battlefield mm -hmm. it is well, from yes sound which is are you here some sound which yes. is yes there are a little bit of troubles but i can understand you so you have asked about the situation on the battlefield yeah. well essentially I think that one has to admit it that uh, the Russians were kind of successful in slowing down the Ukrainian uh, offensive and 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 in organizing themselves uh, themselves at least good enough to 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 bring this offensive in the south almost to a standstill. And uh, I mean, okay, yes, we, we've seen over the three months of, of offensive operation of the Tavria operational group of, of Ukrainian forces. We have seen them deploying some five brigades, perhaps six brigades, to destroy uh, most of the 58 co uh, combined arms army in the Robotine Novoprokopivka area, uh, which means Ukrainian forces, these five or six brigades, have destroyed two entire divisions of the Russian army. However, just in the very moment they were about to break through, to achieve this operational breakthrough, which means start moving south of the minefields and into the depth of the Russian deployment in southern Zaporozhia, they have, uh, the Russians have in the last moment sent or deployed four divisions of the Desantniki, of, uh, of uh, airborne troops. And this is what has stopped the, the Ukrainian advance for, for meanwhile something like five or ten days since it's early this month. Uh, which means they have managed to gap the hole, to, to, to patch up their, their, their 50, uh, 58 uh, combined arms army uh, and to a series of counter-attacks into the flanks of the Ukrainian advance towards south have slowed down this advance to almost a standstill. And this is why right now in the Novo Prokopivka area, actually the area between Novo Prokopivka and Verbove, further east, there is very little uh, advance in, in terms of uh, Ukrainians moving forward. It is not like they are not trying, but uh, they are de facto thrown back where they were, let's say, in mid-July, in terms of they, st they now have to start all over again destroying one, uh, one Russian unit after the other, one Russian unit after the other. And this is really starting with, you know, with, with companies at company level, destroy this company, destroy that company, destroy perhaps a battalion, then a regiment and so on and so on. So this is, again, uh, we are now talking about four Russian divisions, probably going to take another two or three months of similar combat like the last three months. This is the principal situation. And we have a kind of, uh, sideshow, at least the, the Westerners are monitoring it as a sideshow and the Americans do not like it at, at least, the least uh, in Bakhmut area. South of Bakhmut, uh, Ukrainians have against American advice launched another counter-offensive and they have cleaned uh, and pushed the Russians away from uh, Sivetsky Donetsk Donbas Canal and uh, there the situation is such that uh, uh, this is something like four Ukrainian brigades, third assault, five, fifth assault, uh, 88 airborne and 28 mechanized, have destroyed a group of Russian forces, uh, including some six or seven brigades. And especially the last three or four days, they have really completely destroyed the, seven, the 72nd uh, mechanized or motor rifle brigade of the Russian army, but really completely destroyed the brigade in Andreevka area. <coughs> this is something the, the Americans do not like because they think that uh, the Ukrainians have, should have entirely focused their, their operation to the south. 
at least see what, what is going on when, when Ukrainians do so. The Russians have so many troops that in, in the worst case, even if there is a success in, in southern Ukraine, in southern Zaporozhia, as soon as they have troops free somewhere else because they're not under sufficient pressure, they redeploy these troops on the front line and they patch up, patch up the, the, the front line and, 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 and stop the Ukrainian advance again. So I do not agree with the American conclusion here. I do agree that Ukraine had no other option but to run at least two offensives at the same time. And preferably, of course, always conditioned on supply of enough uh, heavy equipment and ammunition from the West, even on three or four spots. We can see now in Avdivka area, where the 53rd Ukrainian mechanized brigade has taken the Russians by surprise and recovered Opitne south of Avdivka, causing them tremendous casualties. Uh, I think it destroyed an entire motor rifle regiment. And, you know, really caused the collapse of the front line, which was further worsened by the Russians then shelling their own troops, started fleeing towards the rear, and they started shelling by mistake their own troops and killed another dozens. And uh, if this attack would have been supported, but let's say another one or two brigades, instead, instead of just being undertaken by one battalion, it would have had serious chances to, to recover the entire uh, Donetsk airport. But there were not enough troops in that case. And uh, now, of course, this attack has been stopped. The Russians have brought all the possible rein reinforcements to this area, and they have stopped the Ukrainian advance in, inside central and southern Opitne. So, again, options are there, chances are there. The Russians are weak. They are not very numerous. And, and they're, they're, we have seen this in Adrika area. In Adrika area, this 72nd uh, motor rifle brigade was down to some few hundreds of troops. But the local Russian commander said, oh, I want all of you out of, on the front line, inclu including battalion commanders and company commanders and everybody, including the intelligence officer of that brigade. I mean, such people are never going to, to fight on the front line. But he pushed everybody on the front line and said, you have to stay there and hold Andrivka. And it came so far that the 3rd Assault Brigade has, uh, and the 5th Assault Brigade have, uh, have fought in a, in a form of a pincer around Andrivka and have closed the gap behind the 72nd Brigade and destroyed it completely. But there was no withdrawal from the Russian side. They, 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 they are fighting really to the last. And they, this is what exactly what happened. They, they had lost some three battalion commanders and... Uh, Two were captured and, and almost all the company commanders were killed. And uh, this intelligence officer was killed as well. So, you know, you see that the, the Russians are not giving up. They are fighting, you know, and even if they are destroyed, I mean, when there is a gap in the front line, they, they, they have enough troops to rush them to the front line and to, 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 to close the gap again. And this is where we see, in turn, that Ukrainian armed forces do not have enough mechanized formations and not enough guns, artillery and ammunition. Otherwise, they would be able to say, OK, another artillery brigade into this area. You seal the front line, shell whatever comes from the Russian reserves. And we move in a mechanized brigade and punch to, to that uh, front line and drive into the depth of the Russian de deployment. This is, you know, what, what Ukraine is lacking. And, uh, you know, it is actually shameful that the West is searching all kinds of excuses, blaming Ukrainians. You know, there's any possible kind of excuse. If you lose 20 uh, Bradleys, okay, we are going to send you 20 and replace them. But if you don't lose them, you're not going to get any news. I mean, what, what kind of behavior is this? This is shameful, nothing else. This is, this is kind of, we are trying to model in the war so that uh, Russia loses a bit, but not very much and not too much, and we don't want a weak Russia because it's going to fall apart and, and whatever else. And, excuse me, the Russian came, Russians came to Ukraine to destroy Ukraine, not to, to fight a little bit of war. Their intention is to, to murder, to, to, to loot, to, 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 to rape, to, you know, to really destroy the nation, to obliterate it from the surface of the earth. And the West is, you know, oh gosh, no, well, well, we are going to think about it, and uh, in five days, well, we have thought about it, but we have to talk to, to think about it uh, a few days longer. You know?
And that is the problem, that is the situation. So there is still not, not enough awareness in the West about the seriousness of the situation and, and the issues. You know, all the West is talking about is there ammunition, ammunition. Well, we are going to accelerate or increase our production of ammunition next year and everything is going to be fine. <laughs> yes, and what until then? Very good question. Yeah. And uh, Tom, if you will speak about Russian uh, tactic and strategy, yeah. what do you think in Russian defense uh, make uh, this defense stronger? At, uh, and what makes this Russian defense vulnerable? Well, stronger. It is, uh, let's say this way, it is not stronger in sense of better or something else. It is stronger than people generally believe that it is especially the public, which is not on the front line, people who are not on close to the front line, who are not fighting there, they have the impression that the Russian commanders are incompetent, shot away by, by Ukrainian snipers, uh, corrupt, they are all drunk, they are all cowards, calling their wives on, on, on the smartphone and complaining all the time and so on and so on. It's all true, but this is not influencing their performance in combat. In combat, they are, they are still, you know, so, so much centralized that if somebody, if one of Russian officers learns a lesson, then all the Russian armed, armed forces have learned the lesson because this is automatically channeled up to Moscow, and to the Ministry of Defense and Ministry of Defense and general staff, uh, general staff of the Russian armed forces, or I'm calling it gen staff, uh, is converting this information into, into textbooks and sending this to all the officers. And they are obliged to read these textbooks and therefore they are learning lessons. So they are not stupid in the sense of uh, that they are not learning lessons. Execution of learning these lessons, of, of the lessons learned, is, is very poor. That is true. And this is why Ukrainian, Ukrainian troops can advance even when it's just one brigade against an entire Russian division. I mean, this is something like, you know, opposite to, to ideal circumstances. <laughs> uh, theoretically, it should be three Ukrainian divisions against one Russian division in attack. But you have very often s uh, situations where one Russian brigade, not even an entire brigade, but one or two battalions from one Russian, uh, Ukrainian brigade are advancing against an entire Russian division. So the quality of training and quality of equipment is on the Ukrainian side. But there are so many Russians and they are so fast, they are, the commanders are so fast in replacing losses and counter-attacking and uh, focusing their firepower on specific selected points around the front line. For example, Ukrainians take some position, all the Russians are shooting at that position. And then there is a race who is going to bring in re reinforcements faster. Russians are going to counter-attack faster with superior force or Ukrainians are going to bring reinforcements and, and, and secure the position. And this is, you know, how it works on the Russian side. This is what, if you if you like, this is what works and why, what is making this, this defense strong. And one cannot simply ignore the fact that there are lots of Russian troops, which means there are lots of people who are pulling triggers, which means there are lots of bullets flying in the direction of, of Ukrainian troops. Moreover, and we have seen this through the last three months without an end, and there is no way to properly emphasize this, especially north of uh, Robotine, north of uh, Novo Prokopivka, and uh, further east, north of Staromlinica. Ukrainian troops had to fight themselves through sea of means, mines, sorry, sea of mines, which means they really had to demine meter by meter of 10 or 15 kilometers long or deep minefields. And this was a terrible burden and, and, and took lots of casualties. And it's a she sheer terror because fighting, you know, you, you do not fight against mines. You are searching for them and uh, you never know where is the next one. And we have seen videos where, where, there are, where you can see five, six, seven mines next to each other. I mean, <laughs> every 50 centimeters that density. And don't forget when these fields were not taken care of for, for two years, the vegetation grew up, grew over, over the mines that they were even better hidden. So it was sometimes necessary to burn the field in order to, to detect mines by the means of, of uh, thermal television. And so 
this is uh, what kind of solutions Ukrainians had to find, to invent de facto in order to find the mines, in order to, 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 to demine all of these long kilometers, long lanes or roads, if you like, field roads towards the enemy positions. And all the time under heavy enemy fire. And the problem is, you know, as soon as one mine is, is detonating, this is, you know, the detonation of explosion is loud, it is, it is physically visible, the Russians immediately knew, aha, there are Ukrainians, shoot everything you can over there. And they were shooting with everything they could. So it was awesome, awesomely problematic just to get through, the, through, through these minefields. Okay, in Novo Prokopivka area or, or in the area between Novo Prokopivka and Verbove, Ukrainians are now, now south of that minefield, but elsewhere they are not. That is the problem. They would need at least two or three such penetrations in order to start seriously crumbling uh, Russian defenses in, in a bigger bigger scale, and this is not yet the case. Uh, Tom, take into account your words about our counteroffensive, like you know, step by step. Mm -hmm. uh, let's look for the situation which uh, could happen in two months. Today it is September. It is still warm, no mm -hmm. rain, but even in two months, even on south of Ukraine. <laughs> the situation will be different. And what do you think, what is the weather factor uh, and how it could influence for, for, for Ukrainian offensive, what, what will change? Well, as you, as you know, I'm not making any kind of predictions even in the case of war and in the case of weather, even less so <laughs> because it's pointless. But it is at least theoretically possible if we have a season like, uh, I said, three or four years ago, there was a similar season and it was very warm into September and it, it continued being warm to October and November. You know, if, if that, that there is such a weather, you know, this offensive is just going to go on. If there is such a weather, A, and B, if the West continues supplying enough ammunition, especially artillery ammunition, which uh, it is still not really doing. You know, you have a situation where Ukrainian armed forces would need some 300,000 shells a month, and they are getting around 50,000, 60,000 a month from the West. So, you know, what should they do? How, how, sh how should they advance in any other fashion, but by infantry, slowly, carefully, you know, through the minefields and so on and so on. You have uh, also, I mean, it is laughable, laughable, but a typical example and not related. Austrian Minister, Minister of Defense, uh, she is very proudly appearing on the TV and explaining, oh, we have now a joint force of five European countries. We have 5,000 troops together. I thought to myself, yes, you can defend a district of Northern Vienna with these 5,000 troops in a war like this one, because, you know, 5,000 troops in this kind of war is nothing. But she's obviously unaware of that. And there is the same problem, you know, with all the other politicians in the West. They simply do not understand how many troops, how many, how much equipment, how many vehicles, how much fuel, food, water, you not know, to talk about ammunition, is necessary to, to, to continue feeding this war. They do not understand. And therefore, you know, if nothing else, firstly, anytime Ukrainians approach them and say, yeah, hey, we need more tanks, we need more artillery ammunition and so on, why do you need all of that? What for? What do you want to drive to Moscow or something else? This is the first reaction. The second reaction is, of course, there are politicians, and excuse me, but I do not know a single politician who is not corrupt. So therefore, uh -huh, okay, let's see. Who, which one of my supporters, friends, and sponsors could profit from this situation? Where could I, you know, arrange some kind of a deal where he, where he or she is going to, to earn extra money? so that he supports me even more and I can go, you know, candidating for the next term as well. This is how it works. And then oh, you have the situation where they start thinking, well, okay, you know, so this is something like you, you have a chart from one to 100 and then on the other position, 90, 92, 93, there is, you know, finally, well, oh, but if Putin gets through Ukraine, he could endanger us as well. You know, this is how far is this level of thinking from them and or, or foreign to, to our politicians and of course you know there is no threat it is peaceful here for 70 for almost 80 years meanwhile nobody cares everything is fine let's get the party started 
Tom, as for the prediction, since March and April last year, you say that regardless the reason, the victory in this war is going to be decided on the battlefield. And based on the current situation in Ukrainian army, in Russia's army, uh, uh, about situation with reserves, about, uh, you know, about number of weapons and other, other things, do you think that this war will be a long war? From yes. Yes, I can answer this straightly, straight, yes. Because the war is going to go on so long until Ukraine gets what it needs, what it takes to defeat Russia. Right now, it has got actually barely enough to, 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 to fight Russia to a standstill. And it is Ukrainian people, everyday people, who are adding this extra and making it possible for Ukrainian armed forces to advance. This is not the Western equipment. Western equipment and Western tanks and yes, there might be better one on one against the Russian or in comparison to the Russian, but they are not enough. So what is making difference is fight, fighting spirit of Ukrainian people. This, this, this determination of your people, of your foremost of your young men, but also plenty of young women to say, OK, I'm going to, to, to fight to get out of my trench and to, to charge that enemy position, even at the cost, at the threat, a direct threat of, of uh, with, with death or perhaps worst of all, mutilation, bad injury for myself. And you, you have to, they all know, they're all perfectly aware, they have to expect, you know, to, 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 to have long term uh, uh, psychological problems because of this war, because of what they see and experience every day of, uh, in the war, because of the sheer terror that they are experiencing every day, uh, every day on the front line. And nevertheless, they keep on attacking. And when they, they, and, and you see this also when there are critical situations on the front line, they are equally ready. You know, when the Russians, there is a sudden Russian counter attack, Russians have you know, suddenly breached the, the, the front line. They are advancing. No, your, your, your troops are very rarely fleeing. They stand and fight in their positions. In worst case, they surrender. Why? Because they know, okay, they are going to be captured in most cases, at least. And it's changed and they can come back and fight again. So it is this fighting spirit of Ukrainians which is making difference right now. But equipment wise, you're not getting enough to win. That is the problem. And uh, this is not going to change unless Ukraine get, starts getting enough to win, which is sometimes hopefully in the future. I hope next year we are going to see. I said again, this, principal and crucial factor is to get enough ammunition and uh, once you start getting enough ammunition then to bolster your artillery forces in the meantime you have to bolster your air defenses as well because you still don't have enough air defenses we see that every night almost russians are, are attacking ukraine with shahid uh, drones and almost every night several of these drones are getting through the the, the ukrainian air defenses that dam causing damage right now they're causing damage to the exporting infrastructure in, uh, in to the ports south of Odessa. Uh, in winter, we have to expect them to cause damage to, to get back to, uh, to, to, to targeting Ukrainian uh, power grid and, uh, and power supply system. Like last winter, when, when they were sh short of uh, causing an evacuation of, of Kiev and so on. So you don't have, you're not getting what it takes to win. We are still very far away from this. And because of that, this war is going to go on, sadly. From Putin's point of view, no problem, because he has enough troops. I mean, enough troops. He, the quality of his troops is getting ever lower, but he's pump, pump, pumping ever more troops into Ukraine. Meanwhile, we are at, what, 400, 420,000 troops. One year ago, we were at 200,000. Had the West supplied all you need for victory the last year, you could have defeated Ukrainians or uh, the Russians. Sorry, only the last year, the West didn't. So you have you know to fight ever more troops, ever more Russian troops, even if their quality is lower. You really have to shut all of them, you know, down, or let's say nine out of ten uh, shot and killed or wounded, 
one is captured in order to advance and this is this is the problem this is you know this is going to constantly increase the longer the war goes on this is why it's going to be a long war and also why the war is going to be decided on the battlefield because put there is no way putin is going to admit a defeat unless ukrainian troops really march all the way to 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 sevastopol all, all the way to mariupol all the way to Donetsk, to Luhansk, you know, to the Russian border. He's not going to admit any kind of a defeat. And even then, he's going to say, oh, this is not a defeat, we have finished our mission, Ukraine is, is, is demilitarized and denazified. Okay, fine. Thank you very much, go back to Moscow, and, and, and this is fine. You know, entrench yourself behind the border, but get out of Ukraine, that's the point. But until that point, it's, it's going to take years longer. So, uh, what is problem now for us, for, for our army? I think maybe I'm not a military expert, but I just think that it is a problem. Because last autumn we have a very a bad situation when we haven't enough weapons to continue our offensive. Yeah. And we give Russia possibility for preparation. They yeah. have half a year. They build, you know, fortifications, yeah. they organize mobilization and ask us. And what we worry right now is that we have the same situation <coughs> this year. Yep. And it is it is it, it will be awful because you know every time we need to start from the very beginning. I understand yep. that from another point, yeah, on the on the battlefield, I, I understand, yeah. But nevertheless the situation will be the same. Do you think it, it is it will be really a problem or uh, I cannot predict what, how is West going to continue sending ammunition and heavy weapons. I, I, I can't say one thing. At some point in time, there are going to be no Leopard tanks left in, in all of Europe. This is why it's laughable uh, to say, oh, we are going to, to send five now and, and three next week and 20 next month and whatever else, because by the end of the year, all the 200 of how, 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 you know, I don't know how many are in Europe. I'm not so, 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 so good in NATO. But sooner or later, they're not going to be here anymore. They're not, not, not going to be left to send to Ukraine. The ideal situation would have been to say, OK, listen, uh, sometimes in, in summer last year, huh, when it became obvious that uh, the Russians cannot defeat Ukraine. Actually, to me, it was obvious already in March, but let's say to the West. Uh, in, in, in August last year, when it was clear, uh -huh, Russia's kind of defeat Ukraine, ideally they would have said, okay, we don't need our own tanks in our own armies, let's send all of this to Ukraine and let them defeat Ukrainians and end this war quickly. It's not, it didn't happen. On the contrary, what happened was that uh, the Americans sent artillery pieces and you know different European countries sent five pieces here and 10 pieces here. And yes, we are going to send you 14, sometimes in early 24 or whatever, you know, promises. I mean, are you aware that out of all the weapons pledged to Ukraine over the last one and a half year, not even half has been delivered by now. 50, not even 50% of what the West has pledged to, to, to send to Ukraine. So this is making everything clear. And then worst of all, they have delivered, you know, barely enough for this uh, offensive in, in, in Kherson. Back then it was still Northern Kherson in Central Kherson. Ukrainians then improvised their offensive in southern Kharkiv and drove all the way to Izium and to Kupiansk, foremost. That was particularly nice. And almost to Svatove. Actually, they were inside Svatove, but they were too few. But, you know, it was kind of stealing from what, from the Kherson offensive in order to enable this operation. And, and it was possible because the Russians made a stupid mistake and uh, I mean, Putin actually made a stupid mistake and he has sent all of his troops to Kherson, you know, to protect Kherson because he didn't expect any kind of attack in, in, in Kharkiv area. So it worked once. And what then happened is that the West said, okay, now yeah, go on and fight your war. Yeah. Very well, Ukrainians. You have now liberated Eastern Kharkiv and, uh, well, you're on the verge or in the process of liberating uh, uh, Kherson. Fine. And then they stopped the fact of sending shells because their stocks were also low. Kind of, oh, this is, we have too little for the case that Putin is going to attack Europe. Which is stupid, again, because Putin is never going to attack Europe because it's obviously he cannot even defeat Ukraine. 
So, correspondingly, they could have sent everything over to Ukraine, but they didn't. So let's hope this year they're not going to repeat the mistake, but continue supplying weaponry and, and, and shells in particular. Uh, yeah, I, I can understand that plenty of Ukrainians are skeptical about this. Let's hope for the best, however. <laughs> Tom, we expect is that we receive F-16, maybe six this yeah. year, maybe six, yeah. six of them, maybe six of them. But nevertheless, we expect is that next year, at the beginning of the next year, we receive much more f yeah. Do you think it, it could change dramatically situation on the battlefield? Even of course, after, yeah. of course not. Uh, look. F-16 was developed uh, on basis of almost combat experiences, air combat experiences over North Vietnam in the 1960s. Uh, there was a realization that the, uh, that the combat aircraft developed uh, for the US Air Force in particular during the 1950s were too big, too complex, too expensive, too heavy, you know, they're not maneuverable enough, uh, and so on. And so they said, okay, let's develop a lightweight fighter which is going to, to fly air combat armed with just two short-range air-to-air missiles, very simple weapon system and a gun. And this is the F-16. And, and this F-16 is going to be very maneuverable, fly, you, know, you can fly fantastic maneuvers and so on. Looks ter terrific at air shows. So they had developed the F-16. This is what led to F-16. And uh, well, the idea was good, theoretically, you know, powerful engine. So, as soon as it was in service, they realized they have realized, hey, we could carry bombs as well, which was not never meant to carry, but because it was it had such a powerful engine and big enough wings, they have loaded bombs to it. And I said, okay, we could stretch it range by 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 attaching drop tanks on F-16, so even more weight and more weight, more electronics and ever more electronics. I mean, when you see. Uh, F-16 flown by United Emirati Air Force, I mean, this is an entirely different class in comparison to original F-16A flown by NATO and US Air Forces of the late 1970s, early 1980s. So, now this modern day F-16 is something like jack of all trades, but master of none. You know, it's, it's relatively good in air combat, but not fast enough. It has long-ranged air-to-air missiles, but not the longest-ranged air-to-air missiles available, uh, and so on and so on. You know, it has, uh, in American arsenal at least, it has specific long-range air-to-ground missiles, fine, uh, but also not the longest-ranged, and so on. It is really, you know, it can do plenty of things, but and many of them at once, even. But not, none of them perfectly or, or, or better than, than plenty of other aircraft. That is the point. But it's operated by, by, by lots of air forces. There is a big industrial infrastructure or support infrastructure for it. It is uh, making the backbone of multiple NATO air forces, and therefore there are lots of F-16s around. And this is why the idea is, or typically short-sighted political decision in the West, hey, we are buying F-35s, and we are in the process of, 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 of withdrawing from service lots of F-16s. So let's you know, get rid of all of these old F-16s, and we can all say we have done something for Ukraine. Yeah, sounds great on the paper, but in practice, you have these F-16s which are 40 years old. They are from 1979, 80, 81, 82, 80-something. 80, 80, 80 of course, there are some newer airframes and so on, but after 40 years of flying aircraft, flying an aircraft, its structure is bent. It, its engines are prone to malfunction. Its avionics is prone, is prone to malfunction and so on. And F-16 was never a type that is particularly easy to maintain. You, you need a very clean runways for it, you know, because it, the intake is under uh, down, relatively low over the ground, which means as soon as it, you power up the engine, it starts sucking dust, stones, uh, even people into the engine. So we, this means if you want to operate it for Ukraine, you, you need particularly clean runways. And you need, uh, well, not particularly long runways, but at least 700 meters or 800 meters in order to, to operate an F F-16. So that is one problem, aircraft-wise. On the other side, you have the Ukrainian Air Force, where the pilots are thinking, so to say, I, I, now, don't get me wrong, I, I say in Russian. Why? Because they have 
they, they have been trained to think that way. They think in meters, they do not think in feet. All the Western pilots are thinking in feet. And this is the most important thing because in feet and meters, this is the measurement of altitude. And as long as you have at least three feet, which is one meter below your aircraft, you're still flying. If not, you're crashing. So this is this is point number one. And uh, then you have the infrastructure in Ukraine. is the same infrastructure which was let, left behind by the former Soviet Union, which means infrastructure made to support MiG and Sukhois, but not F-16s. So now you have to mid through the war develop and construct entirely new support infrastructure in Ukraine in order to support F-16s. This is starting already with, uh, with fuel wolves. On every air base in Ukraine, you have an underground fuel depot. Okay, so now this, these are huge systems of bunkers under the ground. You pump fuel into it, and then when you want to refuel an aircraft, you pump that fuel out of that, that, that uh, underground storage depot into the aircraft. So now, in order for F-16 to, to work properly, you need better filters for this fuel than are installed in Ukraine. So you have to replace this. Then you have different, uh, when you connect the, 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 the piping for refueling the aircraft, you have different valves. Okay, you have to rebuild this. So it is, you know, the tools for maintaining aircraft, entirely different. Testing tools, electronics, avionics, and everything is entirely different. So which means also your pilots, your ground crews, your everybody involved has to learn English because all of NATO is speaking English and flying in English, but while you are still flying in Russian or modern days in Ukrainian, everything has to change. And this is why it takes lots of time to, to retrain, to, re, to convert, we say in military jargon, to convert all the pilots and ground crews and so on to the new type. And you can't do this at once. And the best way is always to say, okay, we take a small group of your best pilots, of Ukrainian best pilots and best ground crews, train them to become instructors, and then combine everything. They are training their people, some of their people, and, and we are training some of other of their people. And this is then accelerating the process. So perhaps in six months, I hope you are going to have an operational squadron of F-16s. And let's hope that these are not going to start crashing because they are old and you are deploying them three times a day in, in combat. But this is easily possible. One cannot exclude this. So this is, this is the situation with F-16s. Uh, I think the better solution would have been to take at least some of the latest F-16C from US Air Force or even you know, upgrade some of this to F-16V, which is the latest variant, before sending them to Ukraine, because the airframe, air, airframes are not that old, you know, because they're not that worn out. Compare this with your car. If you have a 40 years old car, you can keep it clean. You can you can do proper regular maintenance with it and so on. But it is getting old, and it's not modern. It is not going to be, you know, that 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 spirited, you know, that 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 fast and that easy to handle like it was 40 years ago. And there is the same problem with F-16s. Difference is your car is on the on the on the road. If there is a problem, you stop and pull to pull to the side. But in the air, you don't have you know, you are not on the road. You don't don't have any kind of ground under your under your feet. You cannot stop and pull <laughs> pull to the side. You have to land somewhere, so you are in troubles. And, and I understand, you know, Ukrainian Air Force has already massive problems with its MiG-29s and SO-27s and SO-24s. Why? Because they are also 40, 50 years old. So you have to replace them because already now you have big troubles, you know, flying SO-24s twice a day. You, in most of cases, you can't because there's so much to repair on them after just one flight. So you, you are in need of urgent uh, re, uh, replacements. But... I don't think that 40 years old F-16s are a solution. And uh, then, on top of that, you know, there comes the cost. An F-16 costs something like forty, fifty thousand dollar per one flight hour. Yes, this is what you need on maintenance, on spare parts, on fuel, on training, and so on and so on. This is that expensive. 
So it means that the financial burden caused by such old aircraft, which are not going to be effective enough to change a lot in the air, is going to be immense. <coughs> and the next point is, if you need a replacement for SU-24s, which are currently so important because they're, they're releasing Storm Shadow and Scalp EG uh, air-to-ground missiles, the F-16 is not the best solution for them because it's not compatible with them. They have to what, is, for it. What, is, what is the best solution? What would be the best solution? Well, either tornadoes, which are made because Storm Shadow and Scalp EGs are made for tornadoes, or Rafale from France, which you are never going to get because France is never going to give any Rafales for free to Ukraine. Uh, it is a wonder that Macron came to the idea to send you even these 10 uh, mixed uh, 10 light tanks. And, and they were also, you know, just in order to push Germany to start delivering uh, Leopards. So, but he didn't follow up with Leclerc Le tanks, the French president. So it, it's, it's, you know, just a, another scam story de facto. Uh, so I said tornado, tornado, uh, which is uh, also an excellent fighter bomber, very fast, something very similar in, in capabilities to SU-24s, but very old and very complex to maintain. And there are just some, well, there might be perhaps 50, 60, 70 of them left, you know, surplus in, in Germany, Italy and England in Great Britain, but the problem is uh, their maintenance and the cost would be even higher than those of F-16. And they need two crew crewmen, pilot and, and, and weapon system uh, operator. Then you have, as I said, Rafale, which Ukraine is never going to get. And then there is uh, Gripen in Sweden. But Swedish, I don't know, I'm not sure what, what are they doing. It might turn out that they are doing the same like they did with this, with this uh, infantry fighting vehicles and artillery pieces and so on, but they were talking about talking for a very long time, but then semi-secretly semi delivered everything to Ukraine, what Ukraine needs after suitable training. It could happen that, that they are do, going to do the same in this case and say, okay, here are 20 or something Gripens. That would be a good idea because they can carry at least one such weapon like Storm Shadow. Uh, Tom. But although, excuse me, just, yeah. just one more thought in this regards. It, ideally, NATO would say, you know what, Ukrainians, okay, uh, let's cut all the, you know, bubbling around. Here are the F-35s. But this is not going to happen. Because F-35 is actually except for Rafale, F-35 is the only jet equipped with modern avionics and, and survivable enough to survive this war, to go, not just, you know, like uh, Ukrainian SO-24s 20, are currently doing. They're flying to the fringe of the area controlled by Russian air defenses, and then they release missiles. F-35s would enable Ukrainian pilots to fly into the area, deep into the area, protected by Russian air defenses and operate there from, you know, high altitudes. It is stealth aircraft and so on and so on. So it could operate really for, from close up under the Russian noses and really hurt them heavily, repeatedly, every day, several times a week and so on and so on. And not, not just you know, once or twice a week, like it's a 24 scan right now. So F-35 would be an ideal solution or at least Rafales, which are not that stealthy like F-35s, but have excellent avionics, avionics, so which means excellent radar, excellent weaponry, in some, in some regards even better than F-35 and so on. That would be a solution, but this is not going to happen, because again, this is not an in interest of, of whoever invests. This, they are modeling the war. Sending F-35s to Ukraine, that would be a direct challenge to Putin. <gasps> we are not going to challenge Putin, because, you know, if we defeat them, defeat Russia, that obviously Putin is going to collapse and what is going to happen then? Who cares actually? Get him out, get the Russians out of Ukraine and then talk about what is going to happen to Putin. That is at least what I, what I think in this regards. Sorry. Uh, Tom, you say uh, so many interesting details about the uh, F-16, sorry. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, it's F-16. <laughs> yeah, F-16. But uh, nevertheless, if you try to compare this old F-16 with uh, Russian aircraft, yes. uh, if if we compare, uh, what what will will be the results for uh, after this? Okay. Okay. 
the problem is the, the problem following. Is. You you cannot compare yeah. them directly. You cannot say one one F-16 from Ukraine is going to fight one SO-27 or SO-35 from Russia. It's not, never going to happen. What is going to happen is the following. The Russians have airborne early warning aircraft, A-50. This is a big transport aircraft with a huge radar atop of it. So this, they're going to deploy this aircraft in order to, to detect F-16s very early from 200, 250 kilometers away. It is the first thing. Because of this A-50, their crews are going to call their MiG-31 pilots or crews and SO-35s and try to combat F-16s from very far away. It's the same like, like they are doing right now with Ukrainian SO-27s and MiG-29s and even SO-24s. But why these two types? Why MiG-31 and why SO-35? Because these two types are armed with R-37. This is a, a Russian air-to-air -air missile with theoretical range of 400 kilometers. I mean, 400 kilometers is what the Russians say. Actually, it's around 200 kilometers max. Which means they are going to, to, to fly their SO-27 semi 31s very high next to that A-50. He calls them, uh -huh, there is a Ukrainian F-16 coming in. Okay, MiG-31, full speed, you know, at, uh, at high altitude. Why, why full speed at high altitude? Because this is stretching the range of, of the missile it fires. The faster the aircraft flies when releasing that missile, the better for the missile, because the missile need, needs not accelerating. So the missile goes over 150, perhaps 200 kilometers, and kills the F-16. That's going to happen. So it's never going to get, the F-16s are never, or at least Russians are never going to let the, the F-16s get close enough to combat with their own weapons. Which means that we are going to have the same situation your pilots are experiencing already since February last year. They are, the, the, they are better in flying MiG-29s and SO-27s than the Russians are. But Ukrainian MiG-29s and SO-27s are armed with shorter-ranged air-to-air missiles than the Russians. Which means when an Ukrainian pilot attempts to engage a Russian fighter, he's all the time forced to avoid Russian missiles. Why? Because the Russians, uh -huh, Ukrainian, from 50 kilometers, from 60 kilometers you know, away, they're shooting all the time air-to-air -air missiles, which means the Ukrainian all the time has to avoid missiles, eventually runs out of fuel by avoiding missiles, and has, if still alive, has to return to the base. And the same is going to happen with F-16s. Why? Because their air-to-air -air missiles are not as long-ranged as Russian, which means they are going to have huge problems just to, to get the Russians within the range of their missiles. And even even if they get them within range of, of let, let's say, uh, there is MRAM, this is the, the longest ranged air-to-air -air missile in, in, in uh, arsenals of F-16, this has an effective range of, if it is the version C, then 50 kilometers, perhaps 55 kilometers. So the F-16 will have to get to this, you know, to cut the range to this 50, 60 kilometers before firing the missile. But that time, it's going to be targeted by at least one, two, or three, or four, even more R-37s. Avoid all of them, survive all of them, and then shoot its own missile. And there's still not going to be any kind of guarantee that the MRAM is going to hit the Russian fighter. That's going to happen. So I do not expect much to happen. And this is why I'm also saying it's making no sense to send all, F all the F-16 to Ukraine because what Ukraine actually needs is a bomb trucks in the sense of aircraft carrying lots of bombs. Why lots of bombs? For example, right now you are deploying SU-27s. This is a big air superiority fighter, but modified to carry JDAM bombs, satellite guided bombs. Why? Because it's big, it, it has lots of hard points under the wing, lots of stations where you can hang weapons and it can accelerate. So you send such a fighter let him approach the, the, the enemy uh, front line at low altitude to remain hidden from enemy radars, then accelerate upwards, release bombs, and then you see on the video, boom, 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 boom. Four Russian Musta S artillery pieces blow, blown, to, to be, uh, you know, blown away by Jadam bombs. Precise 
every single bomb is a precise hit. This is what works. Or we have seen the Russian S-300, same system, the surface-to-air system, in southern Kherson in mid-August, being hit by several JDAMs. You know, we see this, this kind of things, because this is what you need, and this is what works. You know, mm-hmm. Precise, heavy pu- punch, destroying enemy equipment, this is what works, and this is what you need in terms of, of, of combat aircraft. You don't need aircraft going to, to combat Russian interceptors, because you, right now you are not going to get such aircraft. At, and even if you would get, let's say, 12 of them wouldn't be enough. You would need 30, 40, 50 of them all at once. And this is not going to happen even the next year, not even in 2025. It's at least very unlikely. You will have to rearm your entire, uh, entire air force. And even if you have all your pilots and all the ground crews, which you had at the time at the time the war began, and you don't, you know, this would still be some 200 pilots, <coughs> excuse me, and some 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 3,000 ground crews, you know, mechanicians, people working directly on the aircraft, Con- converting, retraining all of these people on Western aircraft. This cannot be done in, within six months. This is going to take some three or four years, by best will. So it is. It is going to take time. I said. In, in these this six F-16s are going to change next to nothing. This is. This is the problem. Tom, I read you regularly. Mm-hmm. Uh, to, uh, I make some notes. Mm-hmm. Many, many notes. Mm-hmm. And uh, I think some weeks ago you say that Ukraine has only one way to win. What is this way? I said this is. This is through destroying the Russian armed forces. I mean, I, 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 I'm sorry for expressing this br- brutally, but it's really killing Russians. It is the only way. Uh, we have seen this now in in, in Andrivka, where an entire Russian brigade, or what was that of that brigade at that point in time, because 72nd uh, Motor Rifle Brigade was already badly hit in earlier combat. But this is the only way you, you, forward. You destroy the brigade. In that case, uh, the third assault brigade and fifth assault brigade of Ukrainian armed forces were, were, were lucky, so to say, that the Russian Russians on their flanks are too slow to react. So they were capable of enveloping uh, the seven, what was left of the 72nd uh, motor rifle brigade in Andrivka to encircle this brigade and then to you know overrun it destroy it kill you know almost everybody and, and and capture a few dozens that's it but this is the only way forward and uh, again for this you need particular equipment you need heavy equipment you need the mining equipment you need plenty literally endlessly lots lots of shells and the longer the war takes the, the harder it's going to get because the, the more times are russians given to adapt to this situation and if nothing else they're going to, to buy this trash of North Korean weaponry and artillery and artillery ammunition and bring yet more, you know, another 50 or 100,000 poorly trained Russians, send them to the front line, but you still have to kill these 50,000 Russians on the front line. You see how, 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 how determined the Russians are. There are ever more videos taken by Ukrainian military drones showing the Russians shooting themselves, Russian troops shooting themselves. They, they are encircled, they know that they cannot escape, they do not surrender, they shoot themselves, they, sh- they, they take their own weapon, you can see the weapon is here, and boom, into the head. So they are not going to give up like that. You have to destroy it, to destroy them in such numbers, which is particularly important, you have to destroy them in such numbers that they cannot train equal number of new tri- troops, because the Russian armed forces are limited to something like 20, perhaps 25,000 troops they can train anew every month. So it is of crucial importance that Ukraine kills or wounds or captures captures more than 20, 25,000 Russian troops in month. This is absolutely important. This is something I, I, I don't see lots of people talking about. Uh, so this is the only way to, to win the war for Ukraine. There is not going to be any other way. Only then can you bring it to the to the to the uh, how should I call this, into the Russian way of thinking that they cannot win this war, that, that what they are doing in Ukraine is pointless and they have to retreat and, and, and there is not going to be any kind of brotherhood anymore. Ukraine is Ukraine and Russia is Russia. 
Auf Wiedersehen, that's it. Tom, thank you so much to be with us today. Thank you. <laughs> You're most welcome. I hope it was of some use. Please thank keep you. yourself safe. You're most thank welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Tom, Tom Cooper is our guest today, and we are very happy to see him and stay with us. It was Book Live TV. See you.